Well, if you turn to Zechariah chapter number 1 tonight, Zechariah chapter number 1, last week we dealt with the introduction of this book, and tonight we're going to pick up and uh, take a look at the first three verses, and um, as we begin, I want us to see how God sent some encouragement to His people here. God led His people out of their 70-year Babylonian captivity and brought them back to Jerusalem, fulfilling the promise that He made through Jeremiah the prophet. Now, I'm not going to take time to turn there and read that, but I will give you uh, Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12, and also Jeremiah 29, verses 10, 10 through 14. Those verses... Uh, talk about how that uh, they were going to be in uh, Babylon for 70 years. They might as well just get used to they were going to be there 70 years. But God was going to remember them. And God was going to bring them at the end of 70 years. He said, I will bring you out. And that's what we see here. He did bring them out of the captivity. Um, and the, with the Lord here gave the Jews a completely new perspective and that perspective was the possibility of rebuilding Jerusalem I mean think about it Jerusalem has been leveled all the way down no temple, no walls no nothing <laughs> it's been leveled and uh, he, um, the possibility of rebuilding Jerusalem particularly the temple and the wall around Jerusalem uh, they would once again be able to to live, to sacrifice, and to serve the Lord in that city. And what a blessing that would be. The, the Lord sent Zechariah the prophet to, to give those returning exiles, give them some hope. I mean, they were in need of hope. Uh, but He gave them new hope for the future. He showed them some new possibilities, and, and above all, the glorious future that would be theirs under Messiah's reign. That's what we see in this book. Israel would receive a new vision and be able to know God's plan for its future. God wanted to encourage the Israelites through the prophet Zechariah and to take advantage of the opportunity to give themselves wholly to the Lord. They said, look, uh, God's going to do a great thing, but you need to, to give yourself wholly to Him. And the new work was not to be delayed, I mean, they were supposed to be um, building the temple. Israel was to give the Lord first priority, and that's the, the theme of Zechariah's first six verses here. And uh, verse number three is the key. Let's go ahead and read verses one through three. We're just going to deal with verses one through three. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, uh, the, the, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Now they, had, uh, they needed to turn back to the Lord, didn't they? Uh, they the Lord was going to bring them out of captivity, but listen, if they went back to their old ways of the way they were when they were previously in the land, was that going to be any good for them? It was not, was it? Um, the, the, the Lord was wanting complete dedication. Complete dedication is always a condition for the success of a new task. And, and the book that precedes this book, uh, the prophet Haggai explained how serious the delay can be there. You flip one page back in my Bible, Haggai 1 verse number 9, uh, he, he was telling them, he, he said, You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you, uh, when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and he run every man to his own house. They had lost priorities. Rather than working on the Lord's house, they went and worked on their own houses. And they had set aside the, the, uh, uh, the finishing of the temple for 15 years that lay unfinished. And so the, the Lord continually presents us also, I want you to realize, uh, He presents us with new possibilities because He wants to lead us to His best for us. The same way He wanted the best for Israel, He wants the best for you and me. 
And He wants to ignite hope in us. Listen, God's work is a great work. It's a great work. And a great work demands great faithfulness, dedication, and zeal. And uh, the Lord wants us to be all in uh, to what He's called us to do. And I want us to see how the Lord encouraged His people here to rededicate themselves to Him and His will. And uh, we see the encouragement given through three names. Uh, there in Zechariah 1 and verse number 1. And I know it looks like there's not much there. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, uh, it tells us when this came to pass in the eighth month in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet. So you got three names here, Zechariah, Berechiah, and Idu. I, I, these are important. You know, uh, names have meanings. They have meanings. And those meanings were important in Israel. They, they just were. And we, we don't think too much about the meaning of our names. Uh, you, you may not even know what the meaning of your name is. Uh, um, my name's not Jeremiah. My na actual name is Jerry. And if you look at uh, how Jerry is used, uh, things that are Jerry built, not built too well. <laughs> so it's not a good connotation, all right? Um, but uh, uh, it, it, names have meanings. And the, the meanings meant something back during the, uh, the, the times of, of Scripture here that we're talking about. And we, we see that, that there's encouragement that is given through three names here in verse number 1. Zechariah tells us that this word of the Lord came to him in the second year of King Darius. That would be uh, Darius the first, Hystaspes, I guess is how you say that, who ruled Persia from 522 to 486 B.C. And by the way, I'm not giving it, I didn't have it handed out beforehand, okay, because I didn't want people looking at the, at the timeline of history uh, instead of paying attention to what I got to say. But I'll carry these to the back when we dismiss, and they'll be laying on the table. If you want a timeline, uh, my, this is courtesy of my wife. This came out, came out of her book that she wrote. Uh, she wrote a, a, a women's Bible study on Zerubbabel, and she shared the timeline with us. Amen. And so it, it'll be it'll be a blessing to you. You can have that for uh, your um, for your pleasure, but not not until I'm done. Okay. I, I want you listen listening to me. But D Darius ruled over part of the Persian Empire, that included the former Babylon, which had become part of the Persian Empire back in the days of Belshazzar. And although, Jew, although the Jews were granted permission to return to their homeland, understand that they were still subject to Darius' authority. That's important. Okay? Let's be reminded that the time of the Gentiles began with Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar's leadership when he destroyed Jerusalem and led Judah into captivity. And you, you can read about that. I'm not going to take time to go read in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 36, verses 10 through 21, tells us all about Nebuchadnezzar and, and the, the, uh, the destruction there that was uh, carried out. But that's when the time of the Gentiles began. The time of the Gentiles continued over the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, uh, and will last until the Lord returns to judge the nations and begin his reign in Israel, and that's when that's when uh, when the Lord reigns, uh, he, he will be there ruling from Jerusalem. The fact that a Gentile king ruled over them was a continual reminder to the Jews that despite their return to their, their land, they remained under the rule of nations. And I want you to think about this: when Jesus came, say they were looking for Messiah. Part of what they were looking for was came from this promise uh, through Zechariah, the, 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 the blessings that were supposed to come through Messiah. And they were, when, when, when Jesus came and he didn't, uh, he, he, he didn't put down Roman rule, he didn't come for that the first time. 
when he didn't do that, he, when he didn't assume the, the leadership there at the throne uh, in, in Jerusalem, when he didn't do that, when he didn't uh, take and do, uh, they rejected him. Uh, but the, the, the fact that a Gentile king ruled was a continual reminder. They were hoping for Messiah. And they were hoping for this time that Zechariah will talk about later. And it seems as though God wants, wanted to use Zechariah's first sentence here to remind his people that this would not always be the case. And th these names were not by accident. Nothing is by accident. You know that. Uh, and we, we're going to see that uh, their hope was grounded in God's promises. You know, uh, you know, it's not, not going to always be the case that they were under Gentile rule. Um, their hope was grounded, though, in the promises of God. And in, in the same way, listen, our living hope is based not on the things of this present world. My hope is not in who the next president is going to be. Okay? It's not. My hope is not in any of that. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're looking for Him to come. Amen. And Him is our hope. And let's not lose, let's not lose uh, sight of that. Is it important that we get out and vote? <laughs> yes, it is. Is it important who we vote for? We're going to stand and give an account one day of how we voted. So yes, we, we do need to make sure that we uh, vote and vote the right way. Uh, the vote according to our biblical convictions, not according to anything else. Now, um, our living hope, uh, as I said, is, is not based on the things of this present world, but on God's promises of our future with the Lord as well. Amen? We've got some promises, just like Israel's got some promises. We, as believers in the church, have promises as well. And we're, we're looking right now for one of those promises. He's, he's coming back. Amen. He's coming back to take us home in the rapture. Amen. And we're looking for that. But let's take a look at these three. Three names are revealed here in Zechariah 1.1 1, 1 that would give encouragement to the Lord's people through their meaning. And let's look at what each of these names mean and, and the significance of them. First of all is Zechariah's name himself. And we, and we mentioned this briefly last week. Zechariah's name means Jehovah remembers or the Lord remembers. Think about that. I mean, um, the Lord remembered His people. They were in captivity. He remembered. And when Zechariah come with the prophecy, it was like, uh, the Lord remembers. <laughs> the name Zechariah, as well as his prophecy, both drew their attention to the fact that the Lord would never forget the promises He made to the patriarchs. Uh, the promises that God made to Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, uh, are, are they going to be fulfilled? Oh, definitely. Uh, uh, Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16. He said, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of my womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I, will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. The Lord's very well remembering Israel. It may look like at times that he's forgotten them, but he's not forgotten them. Okay? God's promises are infallible. He never regrets any of them. Even if the Gentiles rule Israel, God never will forget his promises. And the evidence lies in the fact that God led the Israelites out of captivity and brought them back to their land. Okay? The Lord remembers that God made a promise. It's going to be there 70 years, and I will bring you back. And here, proof is in the exiles that are there back in the land. God was, God was true to His Word. Um, but why does the Lord remember? So that He can bless them, and that's found in the second name. Say so The second name, Berechiah, means blessed by Jehovah or the Lord will bless. Blessed by Jehovah, or the Lord will bless. The name Berechiah, um, the Lord will bless, reminds us of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, too, that he would, quote, Make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Uh, God's 
God is going to fulfill that. Amen? Ultimately, the Lord will lead His people into the great blessings of the Messianic reign. What a time it's going to be. I mean, we're reading the Scripture, and it's going to be a great time. And it's going to be revealed in this book, Zechariah 8.13, and uh, and Isaiah chapter number sixty one and, and verse number nine also mentions it as well, and we're, we're going to see uh, that uh, Isaiah sixty one nine says, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their uh, offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Uh, the, the Jews are. The, the ones who the Lord has blessed. So when will this be fulfilled? <laughs> when will the Messianic reign come? Now he's going to talk about the Messianic reign later, as I said. I'm not going to jump ahead to that and look at that. But well, when was this going to be fulfilled? Well, that cut gets us to the third name, Idu. Uh, time, which means timely or born at an appointed time. Born at an appointed time. Um... It emphasizes that the time will come. God alone knew when that time would be. And, and, and He would not tarry. In fact, uh, the prophet Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 2.3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Um, when the Lord says He's going to do something, you can take to the bank, He's going to do it. May not know when he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. Okay, and so there, there's hope in that. God will fulfill His promise to redeem His people, to bless them and make them into a blessing. But the Jews will be saved at God's appointed time. Now, what does Israel's future blessing consist of, and how does God remember His people? Well, he recognizes them through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to look at one, just one aspect, um, uh, which is why these three names prophetically point to Christ. They just do. Let's take a look at the first coming of Christ. Look at Luke chapter number 1. I want you to turn with me. Luke 1. And uh, as we think about Zechariah, the Lord remembers. Look at what... Look at what uh, Mary said. Uh, she uh, is magnifying the Lord with a, a song here. And in Luke 1, verse 54, look at what she says. Talking about the Lord, says, He hath hoped, well, no, that word means helped, He has hoped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy. And he, as He spake to our fathers, uh, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Now, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ was coming. What, what was Israel's greatest need? What was our greatest need? Salvation. Amen? Salvation. And he helped Israel and he helped us too uh, in remembrance of his mercy. And uh, what a blessing that is. So, well, what about the, 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 not only the Lord remembers, what about the Lord will bless? But look at uh, Acts chapter number 3. Acts chapter number 3. This is after uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's already ascended back to the Father. The Holy Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost. And this is the... Uh, uh, Peter's already preached that day on the day of Pentecost. And uh, the next day, he and John go to uh, the go to the temple. And they, as they're going, they heal a lame man there. And it gave Peter an opportunity to preach to a bunch of Jews. Uh, down in verse number 12 is where it begins. I'm not going to read uh, the, uh, the whole message there, but he, you can tell that he's talking to uh, Israel. He said, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? Now, when he gets to the end of the message, down in verse 25 and 26, he says, You are uh, the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, okay, to the Jew first, 
that God, having raised up His Son, sent Him to bless you and turning every, it, away every one of you from His iniquity. So the Lord remembers. He remembered uh, we needed salvation. The Lord would bless. He blessed us with salvation of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, well, when did He do that? At the appointed time. Look at Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. And Paul mentions this in his writings here to the church at Galatia. And in Galatians 4, look at verse number 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. When it happened, when the, when the Lord said it was going to happen, okay, He chose the time. The timing was perfect. You know, said, so, well, why did the Lord have Him born during that, that day? Well, you know, some of these questions we can just have to wait till we get home to be with the Lord to ask the questions, amen? Some of them we can take a look and we can understand some of the, maybe some of the things involved in that. But uh, uh, anyway, it's, it, born in an appointed time, Christ came in a, uh, at God's appointed time. So salvation was accomplished at Christ's first advent, His first coming, by way of His voluntary death on the cross and His glorious resurrection. Jesus Christ is proof that God always remembers His people and He will bless them and He will save them. Israel's future is guaranteed because of Christ. Salvation was not possible except of Christ, through Christ's first coming and Him giving Himself there on the cross of Calvary. Now, when He returns, uh, the Scripture says, and we're going to see this later in our study when we get to Zechariah 12, it says, They will see Him whom they have pierced. They will see Him whom they have pierced. Uh, the time of the Gentiles will come to an end. And he will begin his worldwide reign from Jerusalem, according to Zechariah 14 and verse number 9. Now these words also serve as great encouragement for us as believers. Okay? We're not Jews, but we're believers. And, we, and isn't it great that God's never going to forget us? Amen. Amen. God didn't forget Israel. God's not going to forget us. The promises that we have in Christ Jesus are just as much going to come to pass as those he made to the Jews. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, uh, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. We will not let the things that we see going on in this world move us from our assurance of, uh, of God's promises for us that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Don't be moved by what you see, by what you hear, or by what happens in this world. Hebrews 13 verse 5 and 6 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What a promise. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, Hey, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Isn't that great? Amen. Yeah, you know, we, don't, we have no reason to fear. Have no reason to fear. Uh, our fear is of the Lord and uh, we don't have no reason to fear man. Uh, so we see the encouragement from the three names. Now in verses 2 and 3, back in our text, we see the encouragement of a promise from God. The encouragement of a promise from God. Back in, in uh, Zechariah uh, chapter number 1, look at uh, verse 2 and 3. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. That's an understatement, right? <laughs> Uh, and that is the, the proof is in what happened to them. Uh, and verse 3, the, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord was very displeased with his disobedient people in the past, and because of that, they were led into captivity. We, we know that from uh, 2 Kings chapter number 21 verses 14 through 16 again not gonna, I'm not going to turn over there and read we, we have not too far in the past covered all of that in our Wednesday night stu studies 
and uh, it's fresh on my mind. I hope it's fresh on your mind. We, we saw why they were led away into captivity. It had to do with disobedience, not listening to the prophets, uh, abusing the prophets, uh, just uh, uh, until there was no remedy. There was no remedy. That's the way the Scripture puts it, until there was no remedy. Uh, but things were about to change here. The Lord wanted to forget His anger and turn back to them. His grace would be uh, again be upon Israel. Now, the Lord's demand to turn to Him was not based upon a threat of judgment. He's not threatened to judge them here, but on a promise that He would turn to them. To turn to me, and I'll turn to you. Okay? One condition had to be fulfilled. The Jews had to turn to Him again with their whole hearts. This is important. Haggai admonished the, the people to begin rebuilding the temple. Remember Haggai and Zechariah writing at the same time? Haggai is focusing on, mostly on uh, the rebuilding of the temple, getting that after 15 years, the, it's, it's, uh, the work had come to an end, and getting them back to work on that and get, getting that task complete. Zechariah deals with that, but he, he also looks well into the future to look at uh, uh, the Lord's promises that are going to take place later uh, in Israel's history. But... Um, Haggai admonished the people to, to begin rebuilding the temple, a, a task that had been neglected. We look at the look that were there. Zechariah, flip back another page there to Haggai one. Look at verse number twelve. Verse number twelve. Then Zerubbabel the son of Sheatiel, and, and, and Joshua the son of Josedach, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. Notice this. Obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's uh, message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. That's an encouragement, isn't it? I am with you, saith the Lord. Uh, and then uh, look at verse 14. He said, and, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedach, the high priest and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, and the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the year, second year of Darius the king. So uh, the Jews listened to the Lord's voice and were encouraged to proceed with the building of the temple of the Lord. Um, and, and the Lord promised them, He said, I am with you saith the Lord. Now, two months into restarting the rebuilding, they were admonished to give Him their hearts. That's what we're looking at here. This is two, two months difference between when Haggai was writing and Zechariah was writing. And uh, they were admonished to give Him their hearts. Why? Well, the Lord could have said, you know, how wonderful it is uh, to see you busy, you're working on my house, but that's not what He did. Instead, he instructed them to turn to him. That was the important thing they needed to do. Turn to him. Working on the, on the building, that was, uh, that was important. Yeah. But more important was their heart. Uh, I want you to get this. We can serve the Lord without following him, but we cannot follow him without serving him. Okay? I'm going to say that again. We can serve the Lord without following Him. There's a lot of folks that go through the motions of serving the Lord. It doesn't really mean anything. God doesn't really have their heart. They're, they're, they're doing it out of uh, thinking that they're getting some sort of grace from that. They're serving the Lord, but they're not following Him. But the, here we see the Jews were originally doing the same thing. They were serving the Lord without following Him. They, and uh, that's not what the Lord wanted. Apparently the Jews were serving the Lord and without following Him, they were busy working on the temple, but the Lord wanted more. He wanted their hearts. Uh, they weren't instructed to simply work on the temple in an attempt to outwardly fulfill the law. That's not what the Lord wanted. The Lord wanted them to turn back to Him. He says, turn ye unto me. Turn ye unto me. The Lord expressed 
this call to turn around even through the prophet Hosea the as, as prophet Hosea wrote these words in Hosea 6.6 6, for I desired mercy not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings you know, he's, he's wanting, wanting them to turn with their whole heart only when Israel gave the Lord first priority would the blessings flow in full measure now for us as believers, this means that our personal, earnest dedication to Jesus Christ is more important than everything we do for Him, for His name's sake. Amen. Our heart. God's, if God gets a heart, our heart, if our heart and our love is in the right place, well, the rest of it falls in, in the place. It, it just does. Uh, Jesus doesn't only want our service. He wants our hearts. And of course, He wants us to use... You know, he wants to use us as his co-workers, but what he really desires is our love. He wants to have deep fellowship with his children because, if he, as I said, if he has our love, he has us. That The Lord blesses our hard work for him, and we experience that he is with us in it, but we should also experience him much more deeply than just working for him. Amen? We can only do this if we have turned wholeheartedly to Him, living our lives for Him. That's what He wants. Turn wholeheartedly to the Lord. Let me give you an example. Look at Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. And, and uh, this is, uh, uh, the New Testament teaches us very clearly uh, that uh, it's more than, than about what we're doing. It's about what's inside of us and, and our attitude and what we're are, uh, and what we're doing. Uh, here in Revelation 2, the Lord acknowledged and praised the laboring and patient Ephesian church. Look at uh, verse number one, Revelation 2, verse one. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, talking about Jesus, who that's talking about, the resurrected, ascended Lord, who, who, who's the one who is talking here. He says, I know thy works. That word works means toil. And they were busy. He said, I know thy works and thy labor. And that's talking about the pains that come with doing that work. And thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience. And for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Boy, it sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds really good. Nevertheless, uh-oh. Hmm. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now that word first there means foremost in time, place, or importance. I'm going back to the time when they first trusted the Lord. Okay? Uh, he says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do. And that word do means to repeat the first works. Okay? Uh, so you remember, repent, repeat. All right? Remember, from whence thou art fallen, repent of that, and, and repeat the first words. Do what you used to do with the, with the heart that you used to do it with, or else I will come unto thee quickly, will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And uh, he goes on to say there, but this, this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of Nicol Nicolaitans, uh, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay? Do you have an ear tonight? Well, let's hear. Uh, this is the uh, what uh, the message was given to them. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of God's paradise. So, the Lord acknowledged and praised the laboring and patient church here, but He was really wanting them to return to that first love they had for Him which according to uh, what we've read was lacking. When the Lord chose His apostles, I want you to think back when the Lord chose His apostles for service. He, he was concerned with something much more important 
with them as well. In Mark 3, verse 14, it says, it says these words, And he ordained twelve, listen, that they should be with him. He ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Which you think was more important? That they should be with him? Because if they, if they would be with him, uh, you know, everything would be the way it should be. Living for the Lord, having fellowship with Jesus, and serving Him out of this fellowship and love for Him is what, what counts. That's the essence of Christianity. Blessings for our lives and deeds are only found in our complete devotion to God. So, the, so let me use the words of Zechariah. Uh, and examine, let's examine ourselves uh, there with verse number 3. Zechariah 1, 3. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Is there anything we need to turn from, turn back to the Lord tonight in our lives? Well, this is an opportunity to do that. Amen. I trust that you will do that. Father, we just thank you tonight for uh, your word. And Lord, we thank you for the love that you uh, have for us. We thank you for the promises, every promise that you have given to us as believers. What a, what a blessing that is to us. And Lord, uh, uh, so so many times we get all in the tizzy about the, the timing of those things. But, and what we need to be reminded of is that uh, your timing is what's best. And we need, we need to lean upon you for the timing. But we need to trust you that you are going to fulfill your word. Now, Lord, if you're going to fulfill your word, and you are going to, you are going to do that, and you're going to come take us home to be with you one day, and we're going to stand before you at the judgment seat of Christ as believers, and we're going to uh, give an account one day. Those, those things are in Scripture. That, that, that is going to take place. Lord, that we need to concern ourselves with, are we ready? Are we helping others get ready for it? And Lord, help us to, to be what we need to be. Help us to, to remember that first love. Let's go back to the time of our salvation. How excited we were when you came into our heart and life. What a difference it made. Lord, it ought to be, still be making a difference in our lives. It ought still, it ought, we still ought to get a thrill about what Christ has done for us and is doing for us and the promises that He has given to us. Help us to be reminded of these things, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.